Good afternoon to you. Are you going to hear me well? Okay. Well, you've heard that the theme of my sharing with you this afternoon is 2 Chronicles 7.14. And the reason I think the Lord gave me that when I prayed, it was the only text he gave me. So I said, there isn't a choice, is there? And he said, no. Uh, is that our country very badly needs healing. And not only our country, but our church very badly needs healing. And the two go together. Um, I've just published a book in which I am trying to show a path towards healing a nation. But uh, you'll have to do all that reading by yourself. I can't give you anything like that in a very short time. But there's enough in 2 Chronicles 7.14 to keep us going because uh, God the Father gave this text to King Solomon after Solomon had dedicated the temple in Jerusalem to him and after Solomon had asked God very specially that the prayers of the people would be heard in his temple and that he would heal the land He asked it specially, and so the response that God gave to him is very important. He gave three conditions, that if we uh, fulfilled these three conditions, that he would give three responses. Now, three is very important to God because there are three persons in the Blessed Trinity. Um, Very often when we uh, read something in scripture, we forget how a sentence begins And this particular sentence begins with an if clause. Everything hangs on the if. If my people would do this, do that, and do the other, then I will do this and that and the other. If you don't, I won't. It's actually very simple. And if you know the scriptures well enough, you will know that anything that God says he will do, he does. It's actually that simple. You can't twist his arm. Have you ever tried it? The most perfect thing you can do in your lifetime is very simply to do God's will. And if it is God's will, it is the right thing for absolutely everybody, not just you. So he said, here are the conditions. If my people, the ones who are called by my name, the ones who claim to be special, if they would humble themselves and pray, and if they would seek my face, that's the second condition, two separate conditions, and if they would turn from their wicked ways, then answer number one, I will hear their prayers. I will hear from heaven. Answer number two, I will forgive their sins. And answer number three, I will heal their land. Now, the problem is the wickedness and the sins. Sin and rebellion are everywhere in the world today. You know that, don't you? The whole Western world has walked away from God. The whole of Christendom is experiencing this terrible disaster of entire nations, including Ireland, walking in the opposite direction to Christ. Sin is the most contagious disease on the planet. It's much worse than a flu. A flu, only some people get it. Sin spreads like an absolutely deathly plague throughout the land. Oh, everybody's doing it. And I say, so everybody's doing it, so you're going as well. You won't use your head. You won't listen to your heart you won't let your conscience speak. Sin causes illnesses of body, mind, and spirit. Have you noticed that our hospitals are overflowing? Have you noticed that our prisons are overflowing? Have you noticed that mental illness is on the increase? Uh There's one big S-I-N behind that, and it doesn't mean that the people who are sick or in prison, or mentally ill, or any worse than the rest of us. It doesn't mean that. 
And one of the things the scripture is very clear about is that sin causes natural disasters. We don't like to know that because we know too much about science. What sin is, is dis-ease in the depths of your being, and it brings about disorder. Now, if you know enough about biology, you will know that God has put a very delicate balance into all living things. A very delicate balance. There's a very delicate balance between your psyche and your body and your mind and your soul and your spirit. Very delicate balance. When that goes out of order, it affects the whole system, the whole thing. And it causes mental anguish. I want to go at this from a slightly different angle than you're used to. Instead of somebody saying, repent or else just to try and show you what actually happens on the inside. And so this disorder brings about this disequilibrium inside of us. And the dis-ease goes from mind to body and creates an environment which is absolutely perfect for illness. I just want to talk to you about healing from a different angle because you've done it the right way. You had the confessions first then the word of God, and then you have the, the uh, worship of God in the Eucharist. That's the correct order. Can you imagine what the combined disorder of an entire population is like? If the disorder in one human being can be great? Can you imagine how it affects the environment around us? When our cattle and sheep and pigs and fowl become ill, do you look to them as the source of the illness or to human beings? Human beings. It's greed for money that interferes with everything. And I'm going to give you greed as the big sin today. Both happiness and unhappiness resides in our souls regardless of external circumstances. We all know people who have uh, huge crosses in disablement, for example, and they're as happy as the day is long. And there are other people and they're millionaires and they're desperately unhappy. There's not a thing wrong with them. The happiness or the unhappiness is something that resides within you. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. And also your own healing is within you as well. So if you don't believe this, then I'm going to give you an exercise. And you'll either hate me or love me for it. I I get both, don't worry. And it is this, get rid of all negative thoughts out of your head. Not just today, but tomorrow and the day after and every other day. Go to war with your own thinking. If you get rid of negative thoughts, you'll be amazed at how better you will feel. Negative thoughts are the source of so much illness. What are negative thoughts? It's me thinking bad about you and and, uh, complaining about somebody else and criticizing and condemning somebody else and putting somebody else down in my mind and, and having begrudgery against people and being envious and jealous and all this stupid stuff. That's called junk. But it's poisonous junk. It's toxic junk. And it not only destroys you as a person, if if one person in the family is thinking in a completely negative way, it affects the entire environment, doesn't it? It is extremely difficult to live with somebody who's negative, isn't it? Yeah. So then you know that what is going on inside of us actually affects the environment around us. Can you imagine an entire nation suffering from begrudgery? Envy and jealousy, it doesn't bear thinking about because it makes the environment we actually breathe in toxic. That's what it is. And so if we turn away from that and instead of being envious or jealous or uh, negative or somebody else, we make an absolute decision to do two things. Now these two things won't survive negativity. So you've got to go to war with negativity first. I'm I'm taking this route because I want to show you how to fulfill uh, the promise of God. If instead of that, you will turn around and praise God 
for every person in your life, whether you like them or whether you don't. You praise God for them on a daily basis. That you will say something good to them or about them every single day. It'll kill you if you're full of negativity. (laughs) Or it'll cure you. And then having said only positive, good things about the people you live with and the people you work with and the, the people you recreate with, whoever it is you're meeting, that you praise God for everything in your life, good, bad and indifferent. That would be a little costly on some of us, wouldn't it? To praise God for everything. I'm in a crisis at the moment, I'm going to praise God for it. Had a car accident recently, I must praise God for it. I was sick recently, I must praise God for it. We're having trouble in the family or we're having financial crises, we praise God for it. Why? Because if God has allowed this to happen to you, then you must turn around and actually live the scriptures. And that means you must live Romans 8. For those who love God, everything everything will turn out to the good. Everything. You see, we have to start letting the word of God actually penetrate our innermost being and then actually live it out so that you create an environment around you that's completely positive, that's completely joyful. And no matter what the problems are the storms that come in on you, that you approach the storms with this praise and thanksgiving. You'll have a most wonderful life and everybody will love you. Now they'll give you some of their negativity as a present and you don't take it on board. You don't take negativity on board at all. So the reason why you've got to go to war with negativity is that All negativity is the environment for evil spirits to come and attack you, your family, your finances, your work, your health, your environment, everything. They wreak havoc on us. And what they need is a negative environment. If you have an environment where everybody is positive and thanking God for everything, there won't be a demon within earshot. They wouldn't come near you because it's the wrong environment for them. Does that make sense to you? Now, if you're completely positive and blessing God for everything and thanking God for everything, you will also put yourself in an absolutely right relationship with God. And if you're only saying good things and blessing people around you, you're putting yourself in a right uh, relationship with everybody around you as well. You know the old story of the monk who was living on his own in a town and uh, he never said a bad thing about anybody. He was famous for always saying something good and always blessing people. He was famous for it. So the big baddie in the town died. And this big baddie, you know, nobody had a good word to say for him. So they, when the man was laid out in his coffin, this is a fictitious story, of course. When the man was laid out in his coffin, they sent for the monk and they said, what can you say about this man? Nobody has one good word to say about him. And the monk looked at him and he said, he has lovely teeth. (laughs) The one good thing you could say. If your attitude is that you bless people and that you affirm them, you'll be amazed at how many problems in your relationships will die a sudden death. Once you get into praising God and thanking God and blessing the people around you, you create an atmosphere in which both people and animals will thrive. Notice I'm bringing the animals in all the time. Our animals don't sin, but we sin against them. And if your attitude is positive and blessing God and blessing the people around you, you are creating the exact right atmosphere to have Jesus living with you in the tabernacle of your family. That's what he wants. He wants to be in the very heart of the mystery of the family. That's what he wants. And what what have we done today in our modern life? We've pushed him out of our families and we've allowed the black box to take over. 
You know that uh, I think it was a 19th century nun had a vision uh, at one stage and um, she said she saw something that didn't make any sense to her but somehow the church thought this uh, woman was important enough to keep her messages and what she said was I saw a black box she said and a family sitting in front of it and the black box was destroying them but I don't understand how can a black box destroy you we know don't we Unfortunately, we know how a black box can destroy you. So the black box isn't going to help your positive environment. It isn't going to help your environment of blessing and grace, not at all, because an awful lot of the material on your black box is not fit for human consumption, no matter what age you are. So um, I want to give you an example because you uh, concentrate on healing people uh, in, in this gathering and that's fine but if you lay hands on someone to heal them and they're full of negative destructive thoughts inside your laying hands is a waste of time because they're positively destroying themselves on the inside Does that make sense? If a person uh, wants healing they have to start on the inside and if I find a, a person with negative thinking and that, I say, now, the best place for you to find healing is go home and start fighting these negative thoughts inside of you. Because St. Paul says that every thought must be captured and put under dominion to Christ. Every thought. So you'll have all the self-denial you want. You'll have all the fasting you want and it'll all be interior and nobody will know until you become very happy and peaceful and everything, and then they will want to know what happened. Um, so, if a person is thinking negatively, they're going to speak negatively, aren't they? Because the words come out of the thoughts. And the scriptures tell us that for every idle word that man shall speak, he shall give an account of it. Now, an idle word is a word that's not doing anybody any good. It's not doing you any good, it's not doing your listener any good, it's not doing the country any good, it's not doing God any good. Think about your words, won't you? Think about them. One of the terrible things that's going on in this land is that people are using the precious name of Jesus in the most awful way, just in ordinary conversation. And they don't seem to know what they're doing. The book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 21 says, that there's death and life in the power of the tongue and those who indulge it must eat the fruits thereof. And then Jesus said, you must also uh, give an account of it. So the health of a person is the internal condition of that person. We're inclined to look at the symptoms on the outside and many doctors today do that. They actually treat you according to the symptoms instead of looking at the cause. I knew a very, very, very successful doctor in Great Britain, and he had an extraordinary ability to sit and look at his patient and say, tell me what's uppermost in your mind. No, don't give me the symptoms, just tell me what's uppermost in your mind. And then he was able to shoot in and say, ah, this is your problem. For example, when a woman had finished uh, speaking to him, he said, my dear, your problem is that you hate your mother. Go home and be reconciled with your mother, and if the symptoms still persist, come back. Do you think he was perceptive? Yeah. He, he was looking at the interior of the person and seeing that the symptoms on the outside were actually reflecting what was on the inside, because hatred is as negative as you can get. So if a person says, I have no peace of mind, then again, you've got to look to the inside for the answer, because healing them or laying on hands on the outside isn't going to actually heal it. Uh, for peace of mind, you need repentance and conversion. And if you try going to war with negative thoughts and then negative words, uh, you'll probably be ready for healing at the next meeting. Can I ask you a question? What is a sick nation? I mean, our hospitals are overflowing. I don't remember our hospitals overflowing when I was a child. I don't remember our prisons overflowing when I was a child either. 
There were people in prison and there were people in hospital, but it wasn't half the nation. There wasn't one in four people dying of cancer. And one in five dying of heart failure or whatever the heart, other heart diseases are. The statistics for health are absolutely frightening. So we have to come back into this center because uh, God is telling us in 2, Chron- 2 Chronicles 7.14 that there's actually a process towards healing. A sick nation is one that has walked away from God. And if it has walked away from God, it has walked away from grace light, health, love, hope, eternal life, and the kingdom of God. Do you think that's a bit serious? Mm. A sick nation is one that has replaced God and Christ with any other religion and any other philosophy. In other words, they've walked away from redemption. Think of the numbers of people in Ireland who have become Muslims. I can't comprehend it. How you could walk away from Jesus is beyond me completely. Thirdly, a sick nation is one that replaces our saviour with materialism, secularism, rationalism, atheism, or any other ism. We have actually replaced him. And do you know that the word antichrist in the Bible actually means to replace Christ with something else? Now, even even ourselves who are committed to the Lord, we have to ask ourselves, have I actually replaced Christ with something else in my life? Usually it's something selfish. And mercifully with good people, it's not something big. But... We have to look at the fact that if a nation has actually replaced Christ with these things, that we have forfeited our place in the kingdom of God. Do you remember the parable of the the Great Supper? When Jesus said, those who were invited, when they made all kinds of excuses, perfectly ordinary excuses, he said, go to the, the crossroads in the town and invite everybody in because my house will be full. And I have told uh, Catholics all over Ireland that the places you have forfeited in the kingdom of God will be given to the people in China and India and all the other places, particularly places where people have grown up with atheism and are screaming for God in their lives. I remember giving a retreat in Canada uh, where uh, literally countless thousands of Chinese people are coming into Uh, Western Canada Uh, and they almost come straight into the church as well and I remember at adoration this Chinese man kneeling bolt upright on the floor never moved for the whole hour and because I have back problems I was feeling pain for him do you know what I mean and when the the uh, holy hour was finished afterwards I said to him you know you are allowed to sit if you need to he said listen ma'am he said If you have waited for the sheer privilege of believing in God all your life, he said, you wouldn't sit in his presence. He said, to me, it is sheer privilege to be in the presence of God. He said, this is heaven for me. I was not allowed to believe in God. Can anybody in Ireland appreciate that? No, because we're the most spoiled children on earth. Utterly spoiled. I'm just as bad. I'm not talking to you as someone different here. We're utterly spoiled, and so we don't appreciate the enormity of the privilege of having Jesus in our midst. So, such a sick nation is not doing God's will, is not following God's revelation in the scriptures. And that gives us our lifestyle. This is, it's here, not the television. Not what the world says. And what do you expect then when a nation really becomes sick? It falls into corruption, greed, violence, murders, social disorder, and general unhappiness. Can you tick any of those off? When I was a child, I remember there was one murder in the north of Ireland, 
and the whole country went into shock. Now there's murders every day and nobody's even surprised. That's called degeneration. That's called corruption. That's called a nation walking into the abyss. Can I ask an even more dangerous question? Because I don't mind facing the hard questions. What is a sick church? You say, oh. A sick church is when the members, both clergy and laity, are not actually living the gospel in their daily lives. They're not actually active disciples. There's a sick church. Do you think we're sick? Secondly, a sick church is when the members don't really believe in the teaching of the church. For example, in my travels, I have heard priests and religious say that the adoration of the Eucharist was bread watching. Isn't that scandalous? That means no faith in the Eucharist. Thirdly, a sick church is when the members are not actually living the moral teaching of the church. They're doing their own thing. We have pick and mix. Can we tick that one off? Yeah, absolutely. And fourthly, it's a church where people don't really know Jesus. They don't know him personally. They haven't entered into a relationship with Jesus. And the next one is a sick church is where the leadership are not leading in any meaningful way. That's scary, isn't it? The result is that the members, both clergy and lay, are unhappy, disheartened, critical, and many lose faith. Has that happened? So the, the, the question that's two feet high in front of me is, how do we recover? And the recovery is in that text from Chronicles because <clears throat> the healing of the church and the nation actually go together because the people in the church are in the nation and the people in the nation are in the church. You can't really separate them. And it all sits on an if clause where God said, if my people who are called by my name. In other words, Jesus would say, I am calling on all those who are baptized because all of them have been baptized into Christ. Well, that's nine tenths of the people in this nation, isn't it? But do they call themselves by his name? Do they actually reach out to him? Are they faithful to him? Are they in contact with him? We're a bit like children who have gone to Australia and forgot to phone home. And because of that, the Lord has got to call upon the ones who are in contact with him, who have remained faithful and who do call upon him. Now, he says that I want you to really pray. Now, in Ireland, we only have a remnant of true believers. But the Lord is able to transform the world with 12 men, and one of them let him down. He had 12 apostles, and one of them let him down. He was able to transform the world. There's enough people here to transform 10 Irelands. Is that okay? So I'm not giving you a negative message, I'm moving into a very positive one. Because Jesus has chosen to live in our tabernacles, to live among us in every city, town and village of this country. Because he wanted to sanctify the country and he wanted a country that would be his very own. If you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, God has been looking for a country and a people who would be his own throughout the earth. He's tried with so many nations, and he's tried with us as well. And he says that if we would truly come to him, now the problem is that as I speak, the tragedy that has happened in Ireland in the last 20 to 30 years is that the people have chosen by ballot box to walk away from God. You'll say, oh no, we didn't. 
And the point is, we did. We chose to go into godless Europe. We chose to go into the place that was actively working against Christ and against his church. We've done that ourselves. And that's in spite of all the privileges we've had in the past and the extraordinary heritage that we have. You can't talk about Irish history without talking about Christ. You just can't. The two are completely interwoven together. And this is despite the fact that countless numbers of our ancestors have given their lives for Christ. So many, in fact, that nobody knows the numbers. Nobody knows the number of martyrs in Ireland. But our nation today has chosen to forget that, chosen to forget its history, and because it wants a share in the goods of the world. Isn't it sad? Now, I want to tell you something to give you a little shake up. I mightn't have shaken you before, but just in case you didn't. We have two things that keep us from not seeing what's going on around us. And one is that we have enough food to eat. And the other is that we are continuously entertained by the media and gadgets. Okay? Before the Roman Empire fell, the, the, the Caesars knew to give them food and circuses. Food and amusements. Keep the people, just give them enough food and give them amusements and they won't think about anything. Do you find that interesting? Our politicians are telling us that we're coming out of our economic woes, that we're going to be out of them in no time at all. And they choose not to remind you that America is on the brink. We just got a few more months out of them uh, the other night before they actually fall. And they're not, they choose not to tell you that Britain is on such a downward slide that it's absolutely frightening. Do you think that between Britain and America we're going to survive a tiny little group like us? No way. Our, our country depends far too much on the two of them. If you don't believe me what I said about Britain, just Google Money Week. I got it from the experts. I didn't think it up myself. And so, who's thinking about what's going on? Who's thinking about the bigger issues? What the Lord is looking for is people who will think about the nation as a whole and will think about the nation's survival as a people. And the nation's survival uh, as a people who are in contact with God. Now, in my experience of dealing with charismatic groups and prayer groups, you know, since the 1970s, which tells you I'm awfully young, um, what I've noticed is that we're very willing to pray for ourselves and to get healed ourselves. That's okay. And we're very willing to sort of reach out and heal people very close to us, like family members and, and friends and that kind of thing. But we're not thinking in terms of the nation. We're not thinking in terms of the six million people that live on this island. Don't we want them to come to heaven with us? Anyone saying yes? yes. Good. We can't go to heaven alone. It's not possible. We've got to take the nation with us. And therefore our prayers have got to be lifted up onto a much higher level. Instead of just praying for me and my family and uh, all the small things that uh, I can be interested in. Because the Lord says, if you would humble yourselves and pray for the nation, not just for yourself, you've got to take them with you. Because every man, woman, and child uh, in this nation, no matter what religion or lack of it that they have, they're somebody's father, mother, brother, sister, uncle, and cousin, whatever, daughter, son their family and they're just as important as our families and we need to actually pray for the nation if we pray for the nation an awful lot of the problems are going to actually be solved and he says that we need to humble ourselves in other words we've got to put ourselves aside a little bit instead of always thinking about what's right for Frances and her family and so on and so forth What's, one of the things that started me on a public ministry uh, many moons ago uh, was a promise that the Lord made me. 
uh, I said to him, OK, if I'm out preaching to everybody else, who will look after me and my family? You know what he said? These are his exact words. If you look after me and my family, he said, I will look after you and yours. I said, you're on. I get the best bargain. <laughs> look who's looking after all my family. I've never worried about any of them ever since. I said, Lord, I look after your people. You're looking after mine. Hey, just get on with it. If only we could think that way, that we would look to his people, to his whole people, and look after them, he will look after us. Why? Because our families and our relatives and everybody, they're all part of it. They're all part of it. And he said, we must humble ourselves and pray. But you'll say, well, we do pray. And so I've got to ask you a few questions and they can't be answered today. How do you pray? What do you pray for? For whom do you pray? And why do you do it? Four very important questions. How do you pray? What do you pray for? For whom do you pray? Like if I ask God to heal my Aunt Mary, everybody has an aunt. And in the same breath I can say, heal every Mary on the planet. It's not going to take any more energy or more breath. It just takes more vision. Does that make sense? So it doesn't mean that we're asking you to spend hours and hours and hours more praying. It's to put more understanding and more depth into them. It's really better with one trip to the, the uh, supermarket that you get everything you need instead of going back and forth all the time, isn't it? Yeah, we come to the Lord and we have everything in the Eucharist. So we need to pray for the nations Okay, and one of the things we need to pray against is greed. It's destroying us. Do you know that the most condemned sin in the New Testament is greed? You might have told me it was sex or something. Not at all. It's greed. Pleonexia is the word. The desire to have more and more and more and more and more. We're never satisfied. I want more material things if that's what I'm into, or I want more power if that's what I'm into, or I want more control if that's what I'm into. It's more and more and more that we're never satisfied. And so the kind of prayer we need to go into is that we actually wait until we touch the presence of God. We actually need to make contact. Sometimes we jump into prayers or we sing or whatever, and we haven't waited to actually make contact with God. Now, the most essential thing in prayer is to make contact with God. It's totally silly to dial a number on the phone and not wait to see is anybody answering the other side. You give your message and there's nobody answering. Because he says later on, I will hear, but only if you go through the conditions that he's giving to us. And so we've got to actually touch the presence of God and touch that merciful, infinitely loving heart of God. Once we do, we know exactly what to say about anything. Nobody has to give you the words. And you will also pray from a depth within yourself that is, is, is true, not superficially. Um, uh, I criticize... Uh, the, some of the prayers we say at Mass, and I'm sure people will kill me for it, uh, you know, let's pray for all Ireland, Lord hear us, Lord graciously hear us, and we have no intention of thinking about all Ireland or doing anything about it or anything else. Now, to me, that's very superficial prayer. Do you know what I mean? Because if we were praying for Ireland, we'd actually learn what it was that God wanted us to pray for. Like if, if we really seek God for somebody's healing, we've got to ask God, is it this you want or is it that? And if you, if you do exactly what God says, that is the absolute right thing for that individual or that nation. And so in this process of learning how to really touch the presence of God, we actually hear something for the first time, and that is God's heartbreak when his people walk away from him. If, if you read the mystics and the, the saints, they've heard God's heartbreak and it made all the difference. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. The scriptures tell us that what God wants is that everybody will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what he wants. So 
when we turn our eyes to him in prayer, to touch his presence, and when we have come to touch that wonderful heart of God, what he will do then is turn our eyes back to earth, but with his glasses on, we'll begin to see it the way he sees it. And it will change the way we relate to people and the way we relate to our nation because we have arrived at a point where taking up the, the gun and the, the matchet to fight our enemies is outdated completely and totally irrelevant. What we have to do today is to take up the weapons of spiritual warfare and fight for the soul of the nation, that the soul of this nation will not be lost. Our ancestors fought too hard to keep the faith. We can't, we can't disgrace them by just letting the whole thing slip through our fingers just because some politicians want it. So listening to God's heartbreak, we become very humble. We realise, we put our own nothingness into his greatness and into his eternity. And we add our own little drop of water into the wine of his love. And he does it all for us. It's not going to take millions of years. It just needs enough people who sincerely pray. Because the very first condition is if the people... Uh, uh, my own people who are called by my name if they will really pray. Now you know what it's like to have a child ask you for something and you know the difference between when a child is just looking for something and when the child has a real need, don't you? Yeah, well God knows as well. And one of the things is that God resists the proud. It's 1 Peter 5, 5. God resists the proud and he always favours the humble. Our Blessed Mother said in Luke 1, 51, God pulls the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly. You don't have to be somebody important, you just have to be you. And you're extremely important because you're baptised into Christ, you're a member of the body of Christ, and you're destined for the kingdom of heaven. How important do you want to be? Who wants to be an emperor in hell? When you look at the parable of, of um, the, uh, the Pharisee and the publican, it was pride that closed heaven's door to the Pharisee, and it was humility that opened heaven's door to the publican. He was the no good that he said he was. But this truth and this openness to God, he opens his heart to us. So that humble prayer is the very first condition. The second condition is to seek my face. There are many people in this country who are actually ashamed of their faith. They won't acknowledge it in public. They won't acknowledge it before the media. Who are the media? They won't acknowledge it before anybody. What's wrong? Has Jesus ever let any of us down? Has Jesus failed us in any way? Absolutely no. The excuse they make is that the church has failed us. It's strange when you say to them, but we're all the church. Every one of us. Each one of us makes up the church. And all of us are faulty. So if there's something wrong with the church, then what do we do? Repent, repair, and get on with it. And what we need to realize is that the country belongs to the Lord. For God is king of all the earth, Psalm 47 says. Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We have got to give back this country sod by sod to Jesus Christ. Our ancestors fought for it, so will we. We're going to give it back to him. We're not going to let the enemy rob us of an incredible inherit inheritance. And we, God sent us to the ends of the earth to bring the gospel. How could we possibly give up such a vocation? We can't do it, it's not right. That's flying in his face. It's an incredible inheritance that's been given to us. And so we've got to bring back our rightful King and Lord. And we've got to declare Jesus King of this country. We have to. Thank God we uh, consecrated the country to the Blessed Mother uh, recently again. Uh, but Jesus has got to come back as the triumphant king. And to seek his face, we must truly, on our knees and on our faces before God, 
beg him to come back and apologize for all the mistakes that we together have made to uh, send him away. It's the snakes we should get rid of out of the country. The snakes represent demons, you know that. Instead of sending Jesus away. We've got to put aside our own petty ideas and plans and presumptions and we've got to actually persevere in calling him back. Now, it's going to take time because so many, the majority, have rejected him. So it's going to take time and we're going to have to persevere like the widow with the unjust judge. And uh, I, years ago, when a, a little group with myself was praying for the conversion of an individual person, uh, the man seemed to be getting worse instead of better, you see. And I went to the Lord and I said, there must be something wrong with our prayers. The more we pray for this man, the worse he gets. And he said, no, it's not like that. And he said, think of me, he said, as the poor widow. And every time you ask me for this person's conversion, I get up like the poor widow and go knocking at his soul and ask him to let me in. He said, no, and I'm sent away. And then he said, you come back the next day and you ask me again for this person's conversion. And he said, I go and I knock at this person's heart and I say, please, will you let me in? I'm your king, I'm your savior, I'm your Lord, and so on. He said, together, he said, We'll wear him down and love will win. Together. He never thought of Jesus as the widow, did you? And the, and the soul that refuses to let its saviour in is the unjust judge. We've lots of unjust judges, haven't we? Yeah. So when we seek God's face, what we're actually doing is allowing God to lead us back right into the center of his will. We're allowing God to enlighten us instead of running with our own puny ideas. We're allowing God to teach us and we're allowing God to guide us. Now, if that happens, we're on the road to recovery and we're on the road to revival. The, bo the book of Deuteronomy says in chapter two, uh, verse 12, God alone was his guide. And therefore, God led his people out of slavery and into freedom. And he's got to lead us out of the slavery of materialism and unbelief and atheism and sexism and all the other isms that are around the place and back into the freedom of the sons of God. And so this type of prayer is also a journey into God for all of us. And we'll take the nation back. And therefore, our children will be happy and our young people will be happy. They will know that there is a meaning to life and that we're all on a journey, we're going somewhere. So the third condition is, and turn from your wicked ways. And then you're probably saying, Abba, we're not wicked. Think nation, don't think me as an individual. But think nation and think of all the murders and everything else that's going on in the nation and all the corruption in business and the corruption in politics and the corruption in the church and the corruption in everything. Think that, okay. But now when you've done that, let's come down to us, since the Lord is speaking to you and me at the same time. You know if I point one finger to you, there's three coming back to me. Yeah. So if I don't get the message, you don't get it either. <laughs> so when it comes down to us as individuals, wickedness is a different thing to what you think. Um, it is an essential part of prayer to turn away from anything that's not God's will. Now, the thing that stands between us and in, as individuals and God's will is our own selfishness and our own self-will. And so to have real dialogue with God, to have real communion with him, then we have to actually deal with the selfishness that's inside of us. Jesus said in John 8, 29, I always do what pleases him. St. Therese took that as her motto in life, to only do what pleased Jesus. And look what a great saint she became, a uh, doctor of the church at the age of 24. So it's, we, if we go to war against our own self-will, you'll find you'll never go to war with anybody else. We've got to go to war against our own stubborn independence of God because it is in surrender to God's will that we find happiness on earth. You'll get it in heaven as well, but I'm talking about happiness on earth. Uh, St. Madeleine Coudark, who founded uh, a community of sisters, 
uh, in around the 17th century, I think it was, said that the surrendered soul has found happiness on earth. The surrendered soul has found paradise. So what, what blocks you and me from reaching total happiness is actually our own self-will. And so it automatically uh, presumes that we get rid of all sin out of our lives. We've got to go to war with sin because sin is rebellion against God. And as we get rid of mortal sin and then deliberate venial sin, and then uh, go to war with venial sin as such, what you will find is that there's more and more and more space for God and for God's love. And the more you do that, you will find the happier you become. A person who has allowed God to bring them to death to self, these people are permanently and totally happy. There's nothing inside of them at war with anything. That's called shalom, the peace of God that passes all understanding. The shalom of God, the fullness of messianic blessings. So Chronicles tells us therefore to pray humbly, uh, to seek God sincerely and get rid of sin quickly. Now there's another text in the Bible that's almost identical to that and it's the, the prophet Amos chapter 6 verse 8. It is, this is what the Lord asks of you, only this, that you would act justly, that you would love tenderly, and that you would walk humbly with your God. Now it's to get the nation coming back to walk humbly with God is what we need. So the solution that God gives us is if you are in this process, you don't have to be at the end of the process, even at the beginning of the process, God will hear your prayers. It's a most wonderful thing to know that somebody's actually listening. I know some saints in Ireland, and some of them have said to me, I'd be afraid to say anything because God would give it to me immediately. Isn't that incredible? He reads my thoughts. Because two people who are deeply in love with each other can actually read one another's thoughts, can't they? They know what the other is thinking. And I will hear from heaven is that we have God on our side. And St. Paul tells us in Romans 8 that if you have God on your side, who can be against you? Nobody. Nobody. And St. Peter tells us that even though Satan is trying to destroy us, he said, stand up to him strong in the faith because Satan is a proper coward. He cannot, he cannot stand in the presence of grace and holiness. So the more grace and holiness we have, the less power he has. We can get rid of him completely. So when God sees that we sincerely seek his face, and he observes us trying to get rid of sinfulness and selfishness out of our lives, when he sees that our prayer for the nation and for the church is pure, that means it's no mixed motives. I'm doing it actually for God, and I'm actually doing it also purely for the nation, out of love for the nation. Then he will hear us, because it's this purity of spirit that God is looking for. Um, I'll give you an example of, of impurity uh, so that you understand it. Um, if I say I'm going to fast, okay, I'm going to fast twice a week, and then in the back of my mind I say, ah, but I could lose a few pounds anyway, you know? Do you see the mixed motives? Yeah, and the mixed motives means go and lose weight if you want to. Fasting is a completely different thing. Fasting is completely spiritual and it's pure. Now do you see it? Here's a glass of water, and as pure water, it's wonderful. But if it was dirty, it would be terrible. Mixed with anything else, it makes it different. So what God wants is that uh, our prayer to him would be pure, that our dealing with whatever is negative in us is sincere, and that we would persevere in praying for the church and for the country. So then he will hear our prayer, he will forgive all the rebellions against his holy will. Isn't that wonderful? He will forgive the fact that we forsook him, we walked away. 
We have a terrible mystery in this country. We fought for our freedom until 1916, and we've given the country away since. It's a terrible mystery. I don't understand it. He will forgive us for forsaking him, and he will heal our land. Now, our land needs healing. Why? Because the land has been polluted with fratricidal wars, either gang wars or bigger wars, and the land is actually polluted with the blood of our brothers and sisters. You remember that the blood of Abel cried out to God? Do you remember? Psalm 106 verse 38 says, they polluted the country with blood. Our land is polluted by corruption and iniquity of all kinds. And therefore, the very land itself needs to be cleansed with the precious blood of the Lamb. The land itself needs to be actually re-consecrated and blessed. And then the grass will be pure for the animals to eat. And if we stop interfering with the animals just for the sake of breed, we will have pure food to eat. We will have pure water to drink and we will have pure air to breathe, and we can live. The healing of the land begins at the spiritual end and then ends up at the material end. Now, if you have this process in tow, then what you'll find is prosperity will return to the people, and healing will return to the people, and with everybody's minds and hearts turned to God, the church will rise from the dead. So let me just finish by giving you the same message, but this time from Psalm 85. This is from the uh, Revised Standard Version. Let me hear what the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him and his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give us what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. Amen. <laughs>